Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Srili Kapali, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this program, Conversations That Count, is to bring in candidates that are running for primaries so you can get to know them better and learn about the issues that they care about and also raise questions if you have any issues that you would like to speak to our candidates. As Fairfax GOP, we are very committed to engaging all of you during this process. Feel free to chat with us while this session is going on by commenting or asking a question in Facebook. As Republican Party congressional primaries are coming up this month, I'll focus on getting to know our candidates in most of our districts. One such candidate is Kizia Tunnel. Kizia is running for eight congressional districts. Kizia grew up in different cultures. Her childhood was spent in Africa, the Middle East, Europe, Asia, and South America. As an adult, Kizia and her family continue to travel and serve communities throughout the world that promote causes that support the life. Kizia brings in extensive business acumen and management expertise to a multitude of endures. In 2011, Kizia co-founded Tunnel Enterprises. She is also is firmly committed to the community, serving on numerous advocacy boards, promoting education, family and community reunification, community development and human traffic awareness. She does all of this and she has beautiful family. So family is obviously very supportive of Kizia. Welcome Kizia. And I'm glad you're part of these conversations that count. And I am glad you are getting yourself involved with our Fairfax GOP voters to express your opinions and issues. Thank you so much. Thank Kizia, you for having me. Thank you. Kizia, your personal background is very interesting. It looks like you spent your childhood across the world. And I, I always say your past experience and past background is what lays the foundation for future. So talk to us a little more about your background. Well, my I was a pastor's missionaries kid and I have traveled extensively across the world and I've lived all over the United States. I actually went to 14 different schools growing up. So it's given me such a very diverse and a very large worldview of culture, of people. And um, I, I'm so incredibly grateful that I got to experience all of those things because it just really opens up opportunities. And again, the ability just to um, be around diverse situations. I learned very quickly to make friends within 45 minutes because if I didn't have friends within 45 minutes at a new school, I was probably not gonna make friends the whole year. And so it's, it really helped me to get to the point where I'm at now. And now I do not know a stranger. I have no fear of anybody because of just being in so many different cultures my whole life. Kizia, that is so interesting to know. And I'm sure you're very adaptable based on just your background. You, you just probably didn't have a choice, but be very resilient and adaptable in your life. So I'm not surprised as a young lady, you wanted to pick this huge endeavor uh, <laughs> in spite of having, having a business going on and you're working professional and so on and so forth. So Kizia, I'm always curious to know, where does your name come from? Can you, uh, this is again, a personal interest of mine to kind of understand the background of people's names. Well, um, as I was talking about my childhood and growing up, my father was a missionary in Africa and my name is pronounced Kizia, but it is a Hebrew name that should be pronounced Kizia, but because of his time in Africa, it's Kizia. And so it means the essence of beauty and it comes from the Cassia tree. It's a Bible name. So it, it has a lot of meaning. It honestly inspired me to give my children names with a lot of meaning. Only one of them has a um, Hebrew name, but every name was intentional with what it meant and the purpose, because I understood that my name was like so identifying that I wanted my children to have the same, the same identity, like their names to speak about who they are and what I believe that they will be in their future. Kizia, yeah, that is super interesting. Um, I mean, I know my name is very hard to spell. It is Sri Leka, which means it is a Sanskrit term. 
uh, that just talks about um, with respect, writing a letter with respect. So uh, for me, names means a lot and having a meaningful name that identifies a person means a lot. You're definitely living up to your name. I can tell you that. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. Because yeah, due to, uh, I mean, I know recent redistricting has happened. In fact, I was in 10th and now I'm in 11. I think your voters are still trying to figure out if they're indeed in your district or they've kind of moved around. Can you kind of explain the boundaries of 8th district? And also along with explaining where the boundaries fell, I also would love to know the demographics of 8th congressional district. Sure. So the demograph are the demographics fall like Falls Church, McLean, all of Arlington, all of Alexandria, um, Mount Vernon. It goes a little bit into Springfield. So it's inside of the Beltway is where we fall. Um, the best way for people to find out is to Google their zip code and it will find my representation and put your zip code in and you will find out exactly who um, who is your representation, if it's buyer or um, your, your, represent your representative, Connolly. So that's the best way. Um, we get that quite often, especially when we're in McLean or Falls Church. They're just not quite sure. And so it's just, let's Google your zip code real quickly and you can Google find my representation, United States representation, and you can put the, the zip code in and it will tell you. Kizia, do you have that information on your website so far voters can go in and look on your website? I or don't, but you know what? That is a really great idea and something we can incorporate really easily. I think we'll go ahead and get that done. Um, yeah, that's, that is great. And when you were talking about the demographics of our area, um, we are 55% Caucasian and then 45% minority. 20% of that being Latino, 13% of that being African American, and 8% being Asian community, and then some other. So we are an extremely diverse community. You know what, Kizia, I always said the best place to live is in a very diverse community where everybody's views are accepted and supported. Kizia, my passion is minority and immigrant outrage. I think that's where, I mean, I don't do that because of politics. I do that as part of the assimilation process. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you something. Has, have you been any, uh, I'm particularly interested in African-American community or black community. Um, because I know you do a lot of outreach to Hispanic community based on your background, we'll come to that. But is there anything in particular that you have been doing to reach out to our African-American brothers and sisters and black brothers and sisters? I wish that that was the main focus that I had been on for the last 12 years, but that has not. And I am, I'm starting to work more and more into the community and asking conversations to really understand, to get to know. We have, we have a large community here. I live in Old Town and we have um, a very large African-American community here in Alexandria. And I would love to get in. And we have started having conversations with community leaders and asking some hard questions. How come you're not voting for Republicans? Like what, what stops you from wanting to vote for a Republican candidate? And they will tell you, they're very honest. And um, it, it, sometimes it's like, oh, wow, we really can do better. We really do need to know more about this community. Even this morning, I had some really, really good conversation about this particular issue. And one of the things that I was told was that sometimes we um, do so much for so many other minority communities, like in our immigrant communities and our Latino communities, that sometimes the African American community feels left out. And I could definitely see where that's an issue. And I know like in our district, when you have 20% Latino and 13% African American, we um, are tend to focus on where the majority of the numbers are, right? And this morning was so incredibly eye-opening for me and going, wow, we need to refocus and be inclusive to all of these minority communities. So as much as I wish I could say, I've been so um, into it and very involved, I haven't, but I want to be. 
And I will work extremely hard to do that. I love people. I love getting to know people and understanding culture and where they come from and what, where they come from and meaning where their thoughts are coming from and their values and understanding the culture that is really important. Um, I want to continue to have those conversations. And I think that's the only way we're really going to get into that is going in and just talking and listening to um, who they are and what is important to the community. Because, yeah, I think what was impressive with what you said is first thing you admitted that you have not been doing as much. And I think that is the beauty of um, uh, community outreach. Right. And also, I feel that should be the strength of a politician. They first have to admit to things instead of defending themselves, uh, denying something. So I thank you for admitting. Not only do I think most Republicans have not reached out, but Republicans are starting to do uh, better with that outreach. And I think the second thing that you kind of mentioned is about uh, how brutally honest our African-American brothers and sisters and bro Black brothers and sisters have been. And I think that's very helpful. While I was on campaign trail, I've seen that brutality, and for very good reason. I said mm -hmm. there has been, there is a very good reason why they're incredibly honest with us. We can only grow from there. And uh, not to kind of um, stick to the discussion, but I also want to let you know that there is a large Ethiopian community out there that actually truly resonates our values. They're mm -hmm. hard workers. Um, uh, I just enjoy uh, talking to those communities. They're hard workers, very focused on education, extremely yes. focused on small businesses. So um, uh, as a candidate, I think you should absolutely reach out to them. They would love to hear from you. Wonderful. We have um, a lady that I work with often who's from Ethiopia. And I never really talked about politics or where I stood with her. But one day she just she just asked me because I'm always kind of dressed in a suit and, you know, dressed up every day. And she's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm in politics and I'm actually running for Congress. I said a little quiet to her because I just didn't know. And she's like, are you a Democrat or a Republican? And I was like, I'm a Republican. And she's like, oh, my goodness. And she starts texting her friends and she's like, we're going to start praying for you because we want strong Republican candidates and Christians to be a part of our district. And I was, I was humbled, but completely kind of surprised at the response. And now every time I see her, she quickly, like quietly will ask me questions about things because she knows like we shouldn't talk about everything in public, but she, she tells me and I love it. I absolutely love it. So I agree with you. I absolutely see what you're talking about to be true. And I just need to do a better job at continuing to build coalitions and outreaching into the African American and the black community in our district. That's very good to know. And also, Kizia, I mean, I, I would love to take this occasion to say that Ethiopian communities was crucial in getting Yankin elected as well, our governor Yankin elected. They rallied their crowd and they just ensured that education became the priority. And also we'll, we'll get, get to these issues, but for all of minority and immigrants, uh, geopolitics is very important. So I usually tell candidates that look into saying that why are they voting Democrat? And what are those failed policies that you can allude to? So moving on to your career, um, Kizia, looks like you work with organizations that encourage and guide teen parents within the Latino community, as mm -hmm. well as several advocacy groups, which is a noble thing to do. Can you elaborate on that uh, process for me? Yes. So in 2011, I started working with um, a group called Young Lives, and it was a um, in school program where we targeted teen mothers and it was a Latino immersion program. And we worked specifically with Latino community, but we also had um, African Americans and we had um, Caucasian students. It was just really that was our focus because we were in a Latino area and we became um, mentors to these young mothers because I've always been an advocate for life, but I believe that instead of working for just pro-life causes for the baby and the womb, I really wanted to live what I was preaching and what I thought. And so this gave me such a great opportunity to take care of the mother and the child. So we walked beside them, we helped them through school if it meant that they just needed tutors um, or they needed someone to go to a court date because a custody battle or talk to the parents for them or any of those kind of causes, that's what we did. And one of the really great things about this particular organization when I started 
Um, I was asked to meet with a really great friend. Her name is Madi Rubio, and she was from Sacramento, California. And she asked me, or I was asked to meet with her, and we go in for coffee, and we have this great conversation. And she asked me to come on board with her organization. And I said, "Do you um, do you know what I like look like? You know, this is this is like 12 years ago, and I'm going. Do you know what I look like?" And she's like, "Yeah." <laughs> and I'm like, "Do you think that's going to be a problem?" And she said, do you love people? And I said, absolutely. She's like, then it's no problem because you're doing this because you love people. And it was actually like one of the most amazing moments for me to understand fully. I mean, I knew it as a kid, we understand that, but then time goes by, insecurities, the culture that we're around, it starts to change. But then when I had that moment of realization, and I'm like, oh, it isn't about me. It isn't about the way I look. It isn't about the way I think. It's about the people in front of me. It totally changed my perception and it gave me this end to this community that I absolutely fell in love with. And we ended up getting to go and speak and teach other clubs and organizations on how to love people. It was a simple message, but that's the importance of it. It's just being there and listening to people's needs, listening to their stories, and just being a person that says, I hear you, I understand. Um, I might not be able to change anything in your world, but you have someone that, that is going to listen to you and that genuinely cares about the community. And that is really what has even brought me to this place. And I just started working from one organization to another organization because I saw so many opportunities to get to be able to showcase just the power of caring for the person in front of you. Because yeah, that is such an amazing story. I, I said bottom line is the human characteristics and relationships of just loving the people will take us a notch up. Uh, it's not the, sometimes it's not the skill set, it's not the degrees, uh, it's not your social stature, it's just how much you we love the community and the people. That actually is well seen when you're speaking about it. So Kizia, I, I, before I interview the candidates, I take the time to understand their issues, their backgrounds, and I also go through their website. Uh, on your website, there was a project called Project 7 Billion. Can you talk to me more about that? I, I just wanna make sure voters that want to vote for you that go onto your website, kind of understand what that project is. So Project 7 Billion um, was a, it was an artist that started a foundation to take art all over the world. And so I was able to create events um, internationally that was able to bring art and um, teach classes on how to release a person into their identity, especially people who had gone through trauma or experienced um, like when we were in some of the Middle Eastern areas, experienced like war or had gone through something very dramatic, how art can influence and help somebody um, work through those solutions. I'm not a painter, an artist myself. I'm the, I was a director. And so it was my job to take care of the nonprofit and um, be able to organize these events globally. And then on top of that, I also wrote a children's curriculum called Roar, which was teaching children to know who they are and that they're created for something special and that they can release that into the world. And it was incredible to get to do those activities and take this curriculum. It's gone globally, it's gone all over the world and in the United States. And it was, it's a moment in time that I was actually extremely proud of to get to be a part of this organization. Again, it just, it's taking care of people and meeting people where they're at and really saying, this is not your defining moment. We believe that your life has extreme purpose and we wanna help you get through these roadblocks that stop you from getting there. You'll see that through everything I do It's always about believing that someone is made for something better than the moment that they're in. And that's, I mean, that's even why I'm running is, I believe America has a future and my children has a future. And if we work hard and we do the job well, because we care about the American people, we can get to a better place every single time and every year. I mean, if not, there's, there's no reason to do this if we're not doing it to improve the lives of the people around us. 
Kizzy, I'm glad we are doing this conversations that count um, with uh, uh, first thing bringing in such great candidates because most often than not, uh, uh, there, there are certain uh, communities that think that Republicans don't care for people. And I always tell them that actually Republicans do care. And in fact, they care more. They're very logical, very uh, structured in their approach and kind of look at the bigger picture. I always say, if you have to talk about mom and dad, there probably could be, but there is nothing as bad dad, but there are strict dads. <laughs> uh, I said, that's how you should look at Republican party. They have the best interest of the people uh, but they're very strategic and look at it in a long-term purpose. And I think mm -hmm. that's what you're trying to say. It's like uh, yes. working with the people is what, the, so it's kind of um, uh, nice to hear that because we just need to vocalize that more often. People, Yeah, need to even in our company that we own, my husband and I own a company, um, we put extreme value on the people who work for us because we've learned that happy, healthy, well-paid, well-loved employees build the best companies and builds loyalty. And, you know, we were hit just like anybody else in 2020 with the economic um, issues of, of shutting down our businesses. We only did about 10% of our work, but my husband had made the decision that anyone that worked for us in 2019, he was going to keep on active payroll all through 2020. It was a great hit to our company, but we understood the value of the people that work for us and we wanted to make sure that their lives continued. And so now in 2021 and 2022, when we have an immense amount of work going on, we still have employees. We didn't lose anybody because of the value that we put on the human life, that we put on the people in front of us. I mean, it really is something that is a part of our line in every single thing we do. It's about the people that are in front of us. Uh, excellent, Kizia. Very proud of you and your husband and your family. So, Kizia, talk to me about this. Looks like in 2019, you began to work with media and advertising firms with emphasis mm -hmm. on Latino community, education, culture, and politics. This is of particular interest to me because I think we need to focus on ethnic media as part of GOP community strategy engagement. I think we do very well with um, Fox News, WML, but sometimes I say that we shouldn't be talking amongst ourselves. We really need to go and focus on ethnic media. Uh, tell us what exactly did you do within uh, media and advertising sphere? What did you do there? So I created a lot of public service announcements for either different candidates who have been running all over the country or different Republican groups or other social media groups that had an interest in working with the Latino community, especially talking about our immigration issues. Um, either I honestly, I really stayed away from the border issue until this last couple of years. But back then it was talking more about how do we take care of the legal immigrants who are in our nation, who have been here for many years and who are waiting to be able to become American citizens. But the process has been backlogged where it's cost too much money or like I've had multiple people who would say I've paid the money to an immigration lawyer. Then they'll tell me they'll call me in three years to get the paperwork done. And these are people who are here legally, people who have um, done their due diligence, who are vital assets to our communities. And I wanted to change some of our um, communication on how we approach the community, how we started to talk to the immigrant community, especially as a Republican, because Republicans tend to have build the wall, shut it down, send them back. That is I believe a very wrong messaging, especially with how many immigrants we have in our country and the future of America. I mean, we have so much to be grateful for, especially in our immigrant community. Our birth rates are incredibly low here in the United States. And if it wasn't for the immigrants who have been in our nation and who, who are here, especially legally, we would already see Medicare gone and our social security and even more deficits within our economy. So I'm incredible and, and within our job markets because they fill the needs that we don't have. And um, I know that and I see that and it's because of working with the Latino community all the way back um, in 2011 and forward and understanding the community I, I really just honed in and focused um, for the last couple of years on solutions that we could come up that could build the immigration or transform the immigration process 
quicker for the people who are here legally, because I do believe Republicans need to be the compassionate voice for legal immigration. That, you know, we have the Democrats who are opened our borders, who are letting millions and millions of people in, and you have states like New York who are allowing illegal immigrants to vote in local and state elections. My fear is that those voter rolls will not be purged. So they're going to be voting into our federal elections. Well, that's one state, but they'll start doing it in multiple other states. So if we as the Republican party, we can get ahead of this and we can become the pro-immigrant party because we understand the value, we understand the need. I believe we can get in front of the roles, the voter rolls that will eventually become an issue for America, because I want to preserve this nation. I want to preserve what it means to be an American and the people who have decided to be here legally, they love our country. They love being an American. And those are, those are our outreach. That's a great opportunity for us. I think Yazia, you made a very good point saying that uh, Republicans need to stop talking about uh, uh, let's uh, 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 shut the borders and deport and stuff. I think the focus uh, that is very necessary, but uh, I think the focus should be even more on uh, how do we secure our legal immigration process and people that are here legally, how do we accelerate the process? I always say it's a public announcement services are the best way to get to the get to ethnic media folks and also messaging it right. Why are mm -hmm. we so, I always say as a parent, I've learned, uh, I'm a mom myself, I always say, let's not focus so much on bad behavior that mm -hmm. we forget the goodness. Let's focus on what are our strengths and let's try to see where there shouldn't be any loopholes in our strengths. And yes, mm -hmm. we should address our weaknesses, but that should not overpower our messaging that people are only hearing the words where we are saying deport them, shut the borders, that is actually not uh, the way to uh, move our country forward. So you know, Kizia, let me ask you, as an immigrant myself, I came on H4 visa dependent and my husband was on working visa, so on and so forth. I am very, very, um, uh, want to really think about actively reforming our legal immigration process, like including H-1B visas, quotas, and so on and so forth. So where do you think our American immigration policies are failing and how can we continue to reform? If you are the elected Congresswoman, what would you propose? It is a complex, I'm not expecting you to solve it all in two minutes that I provide you, but what would you even propose to our uh, other, your, your own colleagues if you're the elected Congresswoman? Well, our lottery system has really become a failure. And it's been unfortunate that so many people are here on those visas that have been promised citizenship and they work for work really skilled jobs and they're underpaid and they continue to do that for years and years and years. Where instead, if we can move the lottery system to either allow more or it's more how uh, maybe a time incentive instead or um, a work-based incentive. So we can go ahead and process those quicker. There's no reason to have someone here for 20 years and still waiting for their lottery turn to come up. It could be done quicker and it should be done quicker for Absolutely. the ones who are legal. And then also another thing that I really think we can do to change some of the immigration um, policy pretty quickly is if we were to give tax incentives to the business owners, so if they went ahead and paid for the fees, they could receive the, the fees back in tax breaks. And that is that would be a pretty quick solution that we could do. And it would, it would build more loyalty and more incentive for the business owner to want to do it because it doesn't cost them an arm and a leg. It doesn't cost them a lot more. Instead, they're gonna be able to receive that back on their taxes. Because yeah, that's a wonderful idea. And I know IT businesses because I live in this um, Asian American world where we have tons of Indian Americans who are IT. Um, contractors, I know they're already doing that. So I hope it mm -hmm. kind of resonates the message towards all sectors of small businesses, not just yes. in sectors. I think if they have incentive, then they'll process the applications because the fee can go as high as five to 10 grand per applicant. So I think those are uh, uh, brilliant solutions. It's just, I think that's what I really like about the candidates that we have is you guys are already thinking about solutions, putting, I, I say in our management world, I say you want the job, then think like you already got the job. Right. So don't talk about the problems. I think the nation is tired of problems. Talk about mm -hmm. solutions that will resonate with us. Yeah. Go ahead, Go. I'm so sorry. 
No, no, please. Well, I was going to say, I mean, not even just with the people who hold the visas, but people who have permanent residency cards. One of the requirements for um, someone to become an American citizen is that they do a job that no American can fill, right? Um, to be able to become an American citizen. But what we're finding, even in service jobs or skilled laborers, labor jobs, which isn't which doesn't usually qualify for the special visas that are just here on a um, legal residency card that they can't find Americans to actually fill those jobs. And so I would like to even see that extended to that community with contractors and um, the agriculture industry and other places where we have used and have amazing immigrant workers who are here legally that we could give tax incentives even to those types of companies to help sponsor um, their employees into citizenship. So Kizzy, it's a very important that you know that this is live on Facebook. I have uh, one of the viewer, Mr. Fisher, um, uh, talking about ending all mandates is important this year and this election uh, as a flight attendant. We can't go back on mandates in, in, in that industry. Also, there is a comment that says there's so much silent support for Republicans, but 2022, we can be proud being vocal. I mean, that was never the case. Uh, we were all terrified uh, during Trump era to say I'm a Republican, but that is uh, very uh, changing, which is a good sign. Another one is democratic policies have done nothing to help since 2020 election. So these are good comments that we are getting. So very positive vibes to what you're speaking and also uh, to the Republican party in general. So uh, while we are on these positive vibes, as you know, our great candidates, Glenn Young, Ken Winsome, Sears and Miaris last year, we saw a great momentum across all Virginia, especially in the Hispanic community. I've seen um, you know, Garner Young can mention that quite a few times uh, uh, through his um, uh, statewide victory campaigns, talking about how much Hispanics, what do you think has changed? Uh, uh, why do you think, is this going to be Hispanics for Youngkin and stop, or is this going to be an ongoing trend? Oh, I think it's gonna be Hispanics for a tunnel. Okay, excellent, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, I think it's an ongoing trend that we're seeing all across the United States because so many values the Republicans carry are in the Hispanic culture. How we value our families, our jobs, being able to have a home, getting to watch our children play sports, and moving away from this woke culture and this segregation and the end to the American dream. I really think that's the biggest thing that we're seeing is they, they really inhibit um, um, the Republican values. And they're seeing that more and more and more. And then finally going, what are they doing for us other than causing more division and more problems? And when I talk about legal immigration, there's also an illegal immigration side to this. And we have an open border right now that is causing havoc for all over our communities in America and the people who are the most affected by the cartels, by the human trafficking, by the drugs that are being transported are our Latino communities directly. And so they see what's happening, they feel it from their own children and their families, and they don't want anything to be a part of the process because it makes their neighborhoods, it makes their communities unsafe. And they've already left their nations at one point to get away from unsafe environments. And they came here for a really good life. And so now these policies are bringing the things they're running from and they want nothing, nothing to do with that. For instance, we see that in McAllen, Texas, where they were able to get a Republican mayor and then really, really democratic strongholds area. And it was on this issue, it was because of this issue, because of the illegal immigration that was destroying the communities that they had fought so hard to secure. And we're seeing that more and more and more all over the United States, even in our districts. They're aligning more with safe communities, policing, good education, family values, and those are Republican values. So they probably feel are definitely feel displaced on the Democratic ticket. And we're gonna see more and more of that. I think that is so promising and that is uh, such an optimistic message. I think one thing that you said that really um, resonated with me is um, nobody wants to go back to the place that they came from. There's a good reason. They didn't like the drugs. They didn't like the human trafficking. They didn't like that their kids were not 
um, didn't have a future or a vision for them. So they're here. So why vote for those policies that will get them into the same rut area? So um, Kizia, when I looked at your um, uh, website, I think one thing that I really liked is you advocated for pro-life. That's a great thing. Most all Republicans, if not uh, most Republicans, if not all, focus on pro-life issues. But I think what I really enjoyed is you talked about fo foster care and prison reform, human trafficking awareness. You even spoke about elderly care and other advocacy that protects the, and cultivates human life and equal opportunities. Those are issues that you need to tackle with for sure, right? That that being said, I, when I looked at it, I was uh, I was like, yep, exactly. We need to focus not just on pro-life and saying that I'm for babies, I'm for babies. We are, right? Um, I always say we are God for uh, fearing, so we are for babies and life. Uh, but uh, but what are we going to do with that? How how are we going to do reforms and stuff? So those are all wonderful, um, Kizia. But one thing that I was wondering is, are these the issues that your eight congressional district constituents are saying are the issues, or are they are these the issues that we think we care about? Because there's a big distinction, right? I always as a candidate, we need to have a pulse within our community to see what does our community want. Want and what is our values? How do we meet in the middle? So are these something that you hear from your community? Well, we are one of the most socially aware districts in America. And so if we're going to be Republicans, they understand we're pro-life. But what makes me so unique in my Republican, among my Republican competition is that um, I actually have lived a life where I work for all different stages for life. So when they come against a Republican and say, you only want to um, manage the baby in the womb, or you only care about um, abortion or not having abortion, I can say, no, that isn't true. And when we have so many social justice issues coming from District 8, it might not be the highest priority, but it is a priority to some. And it, the, a lot of the people that I talk to that are on the left, that are friends and people I know, they actually respect me because I'm able to say, I understand, but I am pro-life from the from conception to natural death. I could go into even more how pro-life I am about just, I don't wanna ever be God or take someone's life into my hands. And that actually does resonate with the left because that is basically understanding that I'm going to fight for you whatever stage you're in. Yes, I'm Republican, which means I'm pro-life. You know, it'd be very difficult to be a Republican and not be a pro-life Republican. And um, that, that I believe is something worth saying. You know, it's, you're gonna find it if you Google me, it's, it's a part of my resume, it's who I am. So I did just go ahead and address it. It's a part of that. It's a part of who I am. I'm just, I'm not willing to take that back. And um, I, I will have to talk about it. We're all going to have to talk about it. They're going to ask you, you know, one of the things that is happening right now in our country is that Roe v. Wade is going to be turned to the states. It's, I believe it's gonna be turned to the states. The Supreme Court's gonna give it to the state. So it's not even going to be a federal issue for us to be voting on on the Hill. So it's, um, not, not like I said, a major issue, but because we have so many social justice activists within our community, I believe that we should at least address the culture and say, okay, we might not agree on this issue, but we're gonna agree on all these other life advocacy issues together and hopefully find some common ground. And not all Republicans just care about um, the abortion issue, but it's a human issue. Absolutely, Kizia, I'm glad you're kind of dealing with it head on. You have no choice. You live in eight congressional districts, so there are a lot of social justice warriors. And I don't take that lightly. I always say there is uh, some uh, truth to why social justice warriors are so active. It's because they have not been heard for a while. And there is a very uh, good way for us to reform and come to uh, consensus. So I'm glad you're kind of taking it on head on. I always say as candidates, you just don't want to say your stance and walk away. Try to understand their stance and try to see how you can influence your values into meeting midway. I think that's a great strategy. Um, Kizia, yeah, I um, uh, pardon my ignorance. I'm not sure if I saw education as one of your platform, but I, I really would love to get your understanding on what your thoughts are on school choice or what's going on 
uh, with regards to education right now. And also as much as I'm involved with TJ, now I'm starting to backtrack and say, is TJ in eighth congressional district, uh, Thomas Jefferson High School? So if so, I would love for you to address uh, what is going on in TJ as well. Uh, we have so many education issues that have come to light in the last two years. And it's really, Virginia has now struck a national movement for parents to look into the education of their children and the curriculum. It is um, incredible. And I want to first thank you, moms and dads and teachers and advocates who have been fighting this for your children and for my children and for our children's future. This is an incredible, incredible movement. And um, I've learned even so much from the activists that have taken such a strong initiative. And I'm with you, I stand with you on those things. And I absolutely believe that we need to give parents the right to their education that we need to hold teachers and schools accountable, not just for their physical well being, but for the quality of the education that they are provided. We need to allow regulation and curriculum to be at the school level, the local level. It doesn't need to come from the federal level. And, you know, as a congressional candidate, um, I can't always take care of every school issue because there's only so much money that even comes from the federal level from K through 12. It's about $900 of pupil per student all across the United States. That's not a lot. So the real um, power comes from the state and the local area, but I will always advocate for school choice in any way possible because it's, again, it's so important that our kids have a good quality education, that they have equal opportunity to a good quality education. And it's not based on their socioeconomic situations, but it's just based on the ability as America and our responsibility to our children and to our families to secure a good future for our, for our, our kids. Um, and then, you know, when we talk about the issues we've seen here with um, the assaults and um, what is happening in the school system and the parents not being told is absolutely ridiculous. We shouldn't have whistleblowers having to come in. I've even experienced myself having kids where things weren't told to me as a parent in a timely matter. And I either find out from my children a couple weeks later at the table or someone finally says something to me and I have to go and address it. And by then, you know, there's not a lot that can be done because they said, oh, I've already taken care of it or I did this. No, they need to be letting us as parents know immediately what is going on in the school systems. We need to know it. We are the best decisions and de our decision makers and for our children. And we love our children more than any teacher or principal could ever do. And I have my children's best interest in mind at all times. I know that you do too, and most parents will. And we need to know these things so we can take care of them. And it's not just taking care of it from an um, administrative level, but it's making sure our children are emotionally taken care of because of what's happening in their school systems. And we, we do need to know, and I, I, I'm with you, and I, I'm so thankful for the parents that are standing up at every single board meeting and making their voices be known and really uh, holding them accountable. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, yeah, when I came first came to United States and uh, my, my kids started going to preschool, um, this is what I heard saying that in America, um, teachers do it all. They, they, they don't really disclose everything. And I thought it was a strange culture, but I almost assumed that's American culture and I have to live with it. It only took me a while to understand, no, that's not American culture. That's liberal culture where I think um, uh, they, are, they all feel like they have to protect the children. As much as I love and respect the teachers, in fact, I'm a PTA president, so I always advocate for teachers. I think the federal policies are derailing them. Uh, and their reputation as well. So Kizia, what would you tell for people that would say that the reason we advocate for school choice is because we want to gut our public education system? I honestly don't think that's true, but I would love to hear from candidates' perspective. That, that definitely is not true. And we've seen it very successfully ran in other states like Arizona, where the public schools are still well-funded and doing, doing well. Um, but what it does is actually creates competition within the market. 
So if a public school is like, oh no, I'm gonna lose 40 students or 30 students and they're funding because you know, however much money follows, that adds up very quickly. And the public schools definitely need that money. They will have to then be responsible to encourage their teachers to be more accountable to the curriculum, to make sure the students are doing well and to put more of an effort into every single student because they actually would have to recognize the value of every student that's in the school. So it wouldn't allow um, the kids to fall behind as fast because they could go to other options and then the schools would have to fight, like I said, would have to fight to get them back. So I encourage it because I always encourage competition. Competition helps um, bring up better rates of education, brings up our scores, and definitely, definitely encourages a better education for the whole community. And it's not, it's not to defund the public schools. Absolutely. And also, I think is, yeah, it also increases, it's vice versa, even for private schools uh, also feel a lot more accountable because now they have to compete with public PR. I think it's only a win-win situation. Also, Kezia, you live in a world, when I say your world, 8th Congressional District world, where there are a lot of federal employees. And um, I mean, I'm not generalizing this concept, but federal employees love government spending. They love big government because that's how that's their bre bread and butter. So uh, what do you how do you uh, eloquently tell your message to them saying that Republicans are all for small government and making sure there is less bureaucracy, more accountability, more transparency. So how, what do you talk to them? How do you talk to them about mm -hmm. your values? <laughs> I, I'm sure that uh, that could be a very difficult conversation with some of the federal employees. Well, as a business owner, <laughs> And someone who has to understand the economics is that we do have great seasons with really great economic gains. And in those seasons, we're able to kind of inflate some of the budget and do some um, spending that we wouldn't normally do. But when it comes to dry seasons and seasons like we're currently in, we have to make hard decisions for the betterment of our country. We have to. And I know that that isn't like a message that people want to hear or understand. Believe me, I don't like it when my husband puts me on a budget, you know, but we do it because it's best for our family. It's to make sure that we can still afford the things that are absolutely necessary. And we are in a position in America right now where we really have to look at our debt. We have to look at our spending and we have to think about our future in 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And if we continue at the rate we have, we will have nothing left. And so instead of an idea of scarcity at which, which will cause us to go into poverty, we should instead think about what we can do to preserve what we have. And no, not everyone is going to get along with that message or understand that message, but I do believe we have sensible, reasonable, like solution-based people who are in our district that really understand and get where our economy is going and that we do need to start really pulling back and thinking ahead because people have children and they have homes and they have things that they need to be able to take care of in the long run. It's not just about today. And if we can resonate that message, we're not just taking care of today, we're taking care of tomorrow. We're taking care of our future. We're making sure we still have America to depend on because if we lose it all and there's no money, those jobs aren't there anyways. So Absolutely. we have, yeah. yeah, eloquently put it, I think that's important for federal employees to hear your message. And that's precisely I asked. And I think another good way to bring it to their attention is our debt ratio, GDP to debt ratio. I think we need to talk more and more and more. And uh, that resonates. I mean, I can't be making $1,000 and spend $3,000 and uh, leave my children with either nothing or even negative. It just doesn't work that way. So Kizzy, obviously you're a wonderful candidate uh, and uh, I'm assuming you have a great strategy for winning primaries. You don't have to share your trade secrets here, but looks like there are candidates that are all strong candidates. So, um, so what is your strategy, like overall strategy to ensure that uh, you're winning the primaries? 
Well, we have five people in this primary. I think it kind of surprised me that we have so many, but it's awesome. It's so wonderful that we have all of these candidates coming in to be a part of this process. And I'm watching each one of us improve every week and what we're saying and getting our message out there. And I think it's just keep honing in on our personal identity and why we make such great candidates and why we're a good fit for our district and how we can bring change to our to our district, either by winning the election or really being able to tighten the margins that we, we desperately need in District 8 to get Republicans involved, to expand our base. Um, and so just continuing to hone in on what we're doing, building the coalitions that I've already started working with. I've been working with minority communities already and started building out relationships and friendships and um, going to keep doing that. So we, when we hit May 21st, we already have um, minority coalitions ready to go to start knocking doors, meeting with the people. So it's just, it's just continuing again, like I said, honing in, packaging that story, getting it ready for the general election and getting in front of the delegates. And that's the biggest thing is the continuation of either being on the phone every day with, I don't know, 50, 60 delegates a day sometimes. Um, and then honing in who I am, what I'm about, how I can make a difference and knowing that I'm the best candidate for District 8. Because yeah, this might be a good time. I know you spoke about delegates and you spoke about convention. This might be a good time to tell our registered delegates. It's my understanding in the 8th Congressional District, only registered delegates can come and it's not open to all. So that might be something that you might want to take a minute to emphasize on. So we just don't have crew coming in only to realize they can't vote. Also, you might want to just talk about ranking choice order because a lot of delegates miss that portion of it. Um, so this might be a good time for you to talk about those yeah. things. First, I want to say I am talking on an iPad. And so sometimes I look away and it's because my camera is at the top of the screen or at the side of the screen. And so I apologize. I'm really not looking away. I'm looking straight at straight at you. And I, I apologize. But no, this looks um, great. You're, you're doing a great job. <laughs> wonderful. Um, so we do, we have a convention and you had to be registered. I believe all of, well, I know that every um, delegate has now been chosen and you can no longer sign up for the delegation process. But I do want you to know that we have elections every year in Virginia and um, we, we need to get you involved. So just because you can't be a part of the convention this year, please, please get in touch with your local GOP office so they can get you on the list so you can be a part of the process next year because this is essential that we get not just us who are running for Congress, but we start building our down ballots and the people who are going to be running next year. So we need you. Um, but unfortunately for this particular race on May 21st, you will not be able to vote unless you've already registered and been selected as a delegate. You will in November, November 8th. Yeah, um, I really like the fact that you're very focused on not just your race, but you're talking very good about other candidates. And you're also talking about to people about signing up to be local GOP, which means that you're thinking it through saying that, okay, if we can not make it this year, um, we have to make it next year to serve American people. I mean, we, right. um, and we also have to think about our down ballots because next year we have 52 delegates coming up. It's, uh, it's uh, So it's very important for candidates to have that comprehensive overview about the party, about the values. It's not just about them, right? Uh, we are all related together. At the end of the day, we have a, uh, we have a nation to save. Uh, so Kizia, we are in the last few minutes. Um, I am very, very curious to know about Don Beyer. He's a career politician. He's been <laughs> doing this for a long time. He has multiple failed policies. Uh, I would, uh, I mean, I, I really don't like to speak ill of uh, other candidates. Bottom line, but I do like you. Uh, I do like our candidates to be aware of their failed policies. There one policy that um, Don Bayer did that you are like that didn't sit very well with me. That you can just talk about in the last few minutes we have. I actually talked about this today for the first time at a Republican um, meeting, and I I was just I really just became really aware of 
that he was such an essential part of it, but I'm so thankful I did because this is, I believe, one of the most essential things that we need um, in America. And that is to be able to secure the nine um, justices that we have on the Supreme Court. So Don Beyer actually has signed on legislation to pack the courts. So if he is the one that is able to bring and pack the courts and to expand our Supreme Court, he would actually be one of the main ones who would change the structure of America forever. Right now, our Supreme Court is the equalizer. It's been able to um, keep things a little level and it is the only place that conservatives even have a voice right now in Washington, DC. And so to see it expanded and take our rights away even more is one of the most scariest things because we talk about, oh, we wanna secure the border. Well, um, Title 42 is the Supreme Court. The Remain in Mexico is the Supreme Court. We talk about life issues, that's the Supreme Court decision. We talk about Title IX, those are Supreme Court decisions. We talk about health mandates, those are Supreme Court decisions. And to know that Don Beyer is actually the biggest proponent to pack the courts and doing it with the far left radicals makes me want to go live it because that, that is the future of America right now. And that will definitely be something that I will be attacking and I will be advocating for amendments to secure that we just keep the nine on the Supreme Courts. Not even Republicans just want the nine, the Democrats want it too. They actually have progressives that are on the keep nine um, agendas because they don't want Republicans to pack the court. So obviously for America's future and for our opinions on both sides, we want to keep it at nine because there's a fairness that's there right now and it's worked for so long. And um, I, I will be punching at that every single time. We cannot allow this woke culture, progressive culture to destroy the basics of what America is and how we've been um, establishing law for all of these years that doesn't need to change. And that is something that I hope to conserve and be able to attack him on over and over. Because again, every single freedom is based on what happens in the Supreme Court. Absolutely, because yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think you eloquently put in saying that anything like including healthcare mandates, Obamacare, defunding the police, everything at the end of the day. In fact, the TJ coalition, uh, TJ case right now is in Supreme Court too. Harvard law case was there, Harvard law education. So it's like everything kind of stops and like the buck stops right there at Supreme Court. And the minute we pack the court, we are losing our country by storm. So I am very thankful that you noticed that about Don Bayer. I do have a couple of other failed policies, but um, but I'm sure anybody can look up at, at, at the failed policies, but you brought up the, the most important one. And I'm very thankful for you for, for having uh, observed that and bringing it to our viewers' attention. Uh, Kizia, would you, I mean, did I miss asking you something very crucial? I always, in the last two minutes, uh, I, I do not want candidates to walk away saying that I wish I would have expressed this to my viewers. That was the most important issue of my campaign. Is there anything that I missed? I don't think so. I really, um, I just want you, I just want you and the people from the 8th District to know I am so incredibly grateful to be a part of this process. Um, I have enjoyed it so much. Like I, I didn't ever really know how I would love this or be a part of this. I'm a humanitarian at heart and I didn't know how it would translate to politics, but I'm learning. It's just about the people. And this gets me out there and I get to be a part of what I've loved my whole life. And I just, I thank you for your kindness and your support and the conversations I've had. And thank you for coming to events. And um, I really do look forward to gaining your support on May 21st and getting to represent you into the general, because I believe we can do really great things, especially with our communities and expanding the Republican party. So thank you so much. 
Kizia, thank you for joining us and for, for putting yourself and your family out there. I know a lot of time, treasure and talent goes into running races. I've ran myself, so I kind of understand that feeling. This was a wonderful conversation. I think you summed up very well. You are a humanitarian. I can see that. You love people. <laughs> And a humanitarian turned politician is very good versus a career politician that makes a living out of it. I wish you the very best in primaries. Uh, if you are the chosen candidate, I, I do ask you to uh, come by again so we can actually deep dive into issues that are uh, plaguing not only our country, which I think we covered most of it, but I really, really would like to deep dive into what our eight congressional district constituents wants. Uh, I want to kind of break down each and every issue, including uh, defending the police. I want to talk about um, mm -hmm. our national health care system that uh, uh, progressives are pushing for. I do want to talk about LGBTQ issues. I want to talk about social justice warriors issues and what we can do to kind of ensure that our values are integrated into the culture. So a lot of things. So I wish you would come back and um, visit us again. <laughs> it will be my pleasure. Thank you so, so much. I enjoyed this and thank you for what you're doing for your community and for other communities. I just, I appreciate it today, tonight. Thank you, Kizia. Viewers, you've seen Kizia speak so eloquently and wonderfully about her, not only her personal professional life, but what she has done to outreach thus far within the community. Uh, she also spoke about her shortcomings, but she's willing to kind of work on it. I sincerely wish you all will take the time to review this video, share it with anybody and everybody that you know in 8th Congressional District. Our candidates uh, do not have uh, the, uh, the uh, I say the cash machines that Democrats have. We solely re, re, kind of uh, fall back on our own viewers and our own voters and our own constituents to kind of help us kind of move to that next level. Please share this video far and wide into your community. Share it with your friends. Subscribe to our Fairfax GOP Facebook page so you actually get the links when we are starting to open up this conversation. As soon as we go live, you'll kind of hear that bell ring if you're subscribed. So please continue to support Conversations That Count. Tomorrow, I'm going to have Jim Miles, who is running for 11th Congressional District. Jim will be on with us at 6 p.m. I hope you all will tune in and learn more about uh, Jim Miles as well. When you, uh, when you tune in, as I said, please don't forget to subscribe and share these videos. Uh, Kezia, thank you again. Uh, and thanks for our audience for patiently listening to us. God bless you, your wonderful family, and God bless, the, uh, God bless our great nation. Have a wonderful Saturday evening.